G'day, I've got Aubrey de Grey with us. And we're just about to discuss uh, Google's announcement of Calico. Um, so Larry Page has announced this on his uh, G Plus account and also on Google. Um, and also uh, one of the art, uh, art, one of the directors of Apple has also joined forces with Google about this. And so what could a company like Google, who has about 55 million billion, sorry, dollars at their fingertips do to <laughs> fight aging? Well, of course, they could do a very great deal indeed. I've been saying for the past 10 years that we probably only need about $100 million a year for only about 10 years in order to pursue pretty much everything that promising with regard to the development of anti-aging medicine that really works. And that number is as small as it is mainly because the work that needs to be done is early stage work in cell culture and in mice rather than clinical work which will come after that. Uh, but it's looking like Calico is likely to be able to make that difference because for sure they have, as far as we understand, been thinking in terms of being predominantly an early stage research organization in the first instance rather than trying to make money quickly as um, smaller private, in, um, private outfits tend to, tend to be. So that's all very good news. Um, on the other hand, it could all go terribly wrong because they could end up deciding to go too far in the basic research direction and essentially duplicate and um, fail to complement, if you like, the, uh, the work that's already being funded to a respectable degree by the government and by um, entities like that. That's basically what happened about 15 years ago when Larry Ellison, another extremely wealthy person, decided to put money into this. Yes, and, uh, from Oracle. It's not actually announced yet, but it's not actually been formally announced, but everyone knows, so to speak, that the Ellison Foundation is actually about to close down having essentially, um, well, I don't know, lost, uh, Ellison having lost interest in it, I guess, is what it really comes down to. Um, yeah, so we're hoping that's not going to happen. And we're certainly doing our best to arrange to uh, have close contacts with the decision makers at Calico. Uh, a slightly worrying thing is that they haven't reached out to us already, um, despite obviously knowing who we are and the fact that we're only a mile or two across the street from, um, from them. Uh, but we're hoping that we'll be able to change that pretty soon. Excellent. So, I mean, it seems like um, there's a, 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 a... In a lot of people's eyes, this is exciting. But, uh, to my view, not enough. I mean, we've just had the grand final, which is like a, a footy... The grand final of Australian rules football last night. And in the streets, people were parading down the street and getting really happy and saying, hey, wow, this guy kicked some inflatable objects through a couple of sticks a number of times. Wow, that's amazing. But when there's a breakthrough in science and when there's a break... You know, when there's significant milestones reached in science, people don't get that excited, generally. Um, I wish it weren't the case, but... You know, maybe. Do you think this is cause to for some optimism? Um, well, yeah. I mean, I think you've got to live with the fact that most people don't have a good appreciation of pioneering work. After all, pioneering work, more or less by definition, has no real practical relevance to people's lives for quite a few years to come. And most people are you know, too busy, you know, getting food on the table for their family to be, you know, have to have a luxury of thinking and, and spending much time on um, stuff that won't actually be r real for a decade or maybe more. Mm. Um, I think why we have to look is to the elite, the people who do have the luxury of that amount of, uh, that ability to, um, to be more visionary. And the question then is, what's visionary and what's just like fantasy? And of course, a great deal of the difficulty that any advocate of any really pioneering new approach to, the, to addressing any technological problem is precisely to convince other people who don't start out having the same ideas uh, that what they're saying is actually realistic and is not simply fantasy. 
certainly I've had that problem, and I'm fairly pleased with how it's gone, but clearly there's a long way to go. So in that sense, the announcement that there's going to be such a well-funded company uh, putting, you know, explicitly putting their, if you like, their reputation really, not just their money, um, behind this concept, that in and of itself is an enormous breakthrough, irrespective of what this company actually ends up spending that money on. So um, you've spoken about the pro-aging trance um, and the logic of like denial of aging related issues like aging is ghastly um, and it used to be inevitable but no longer so. Um, do you think this is helping? Uh, well, well, first of all, what is the pro-aging trance and do you think that uh, Google's announcement will help um, defeat this trance? So that's a term that I coined many years ago now, and I don't actually use it all that much anymore because some of my colleagues at least tell me that it perhaps sounds a little bit too deprecatory. Mm, um, but essentially what I'm trying to convey with that phrase is that people have got into a state of mind where they deliberately put out of their minds information that essentially might get their hopes up and might make them think that there is some kind of um, chance of progress against aging. Uh, largely because uh, they you know, they don't want those hopes to be dashed if progress ends up being slower than we would hope it might be. And, you know, one can relate to that, but that doesn't mean that it's not an enormous problem. You know, it certainly is an enormous problem that people are so ambivalent about the even the desirability, let alone the feasibility, of doing something serious to bring aging under medical control. Um, as to whether the Google announcement will have some bearing on the pro aging trance, I think it might. I think that everybody has their own particularly personal ways of essentially um, putting aging out of their minds. And for some people, the um, main way is the authority, so to speak, that comes with the lack of any major organization that they might respect for other reasons. Um, that is demonstrating any kind of um, credibility here, any kind of credence for the idea that we might actually be able to do this. So yes, I think the, the, a number of people may be given a big reason to think again about whether aging is so inevitable as all that as a result of this announcement. Definitely. So it's hard to know the approach that Google will take at the moment, but at the, um, what is your approach and um, why do you take the this approach? So our approach at Sense Research Foundation is all about rejuvenation. It's all about taking the various types of molecular and cellular damage that accumulate throughout life as side effects of the body's normal operation and which eventually contribute to age-related disease and disability. Taking those things and rather than simply trying to essentially optimize the way the body works so that so as to minimize the rate at which it makes those types of damage. Instead of that, we're looking at actually trying to repair that damage. This has two major advantages, we believe, over the traditional approach of just trying to slow down the creation of damage. The first one is that it has the potential of being just as effective for people who are already in middle age or older as it would for young people, simply because in the case of um, slowing aging damage down, you've only got the possibility of, let's say, um, postponing the um, ill health of old age by a small amount if you start late, and you have to start early in order to postpone it by a lot, whereas if you're repairing the damage, you can start as late as you like. The other thing that we feel is a big advantage of this approach is that it's much more likely to be possible without creation of side effects. And that's essentially because if you're trying to slow the creation of damage down, you've got to interfere in this enormously complex and intractable and poorly understood network of processes that the body engages in in order to keep us alive in the first place. Um, whereas if you're repairing damage, then essentially your target, your medical target, are things that are not participating in metabolism. They are things that are essentially byproducts, side effects of metabolism, which are only going to matter and sort of to come and feed back into metabolism once they accumulate to a pathogenic level of abundance. Excellent. So um, what is being, what, what is SENS doing about, what are some recent research um, that SENS has been doing 
that that'll help um, I guess mitigate the uh, the effects through rejuvenate of aging through rejuvenative therapy. We're doing pretty well now. We, our budget these days is between four and five million dollars a year, mm -hmm. and with that money, we have now gone up to around sixteen, seventeen different projects that we're supporting. Three of them are in our research laboratory of our own in Mountain View, California, where we have a few thousand square feet of lab space. And the others are in various university labs around the world, mostly in the USA, some elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, some of those projects are very new. They've only started, been started in the last year or so. And so, of course, in the, in the nature of science that you don't expect any significant results from projects like that yet. But... Some of them have been going more like four or five years, and those projects are really beginning to bear fruit now. Nice. The first, I would say, the first real dramatic proof of concept breakthrough that we were able to announce was just a year ago now, when the group that we're funding at Rice University in Houston um, demonstrated that they could protect cells in culture from the toxic effects of the main molecule that drives the progression of cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. And the way they did that section was by introducing a bacterial gene that encodes an enzyme that breaks down this toxic molecule. The human genome doesn't have any enzymes that can break this molecule down. That's why the molecule accumulates and is increasingly toxic in the artery. But we found bacteria that can do it. We found the genes that, that they are using to do it. And we modified those genes so that they can be incorporated into human cells and the enzyme targeted to the correct place in the cell so that it actually works. And the result was very, very unequivocal. We were able to show that for a range of concentrations of this, um, of this toxic molecule, cells that would, no would normally mostly die uh, were in fact mostly able to survive because the molecule was being broken down. We're now at the point of repeating that work using a different type of cell, a type of cell that is more relevant to atherosclerosis itself, and as soon as we've got that working, we will be starting to make a lot of noise about it. Another project that is just coming to fruition now is something that we've been funding for about three years at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City. There, we are um, showing, we're looking at the accumulation of what are called epimutations. So that is like mutations, except that they don't involve changes to the DNA sequence. They involve changes instead to the chemical modifications of that sequence that determine which genes are turned on and off in a given cell. And it's been, there's been a big question um, for many, many years as to whether these epimutations accumulate to, at significant rates during aging. If they do, then we need to figure out a way to fix that. But if they don't, then we don't need to figure out a way to fix it because it just doesn't accumulate to a pathogenic level in a currently normal lifetime. And um, we had to make some extremely impressive technical advances in order to even ask this question. And that's what we're about to be publishing in a high-profile journal in the next few months, I would say. So we're very happy about that. But that's just two examples of the sorts of things that are going on right now at Science Research Foundation. Excellent. Well, then, I mean, what what do you see um, uh, as the likely future for rejuvenate, re rejuvenative medicine inside SINS, um, but also in affiliated organisations like ARMI in Australia? Well, it's pretty clear that the rejuvenation paradigm, the idea of applying regenerative medicine in its broader sense to the problems of ageing, is gaining a great deal of credibility year on year partly because of the successes of regenerative medicine generally applied to problems other than aging, and partly because of the early stage progress that we and others, but especially we, are making in the lab, the sort of things I just told you about. Actually, you mentioned ARMI, that's a great example. The head of ARMI, Nadia Rosenthal, is one of our big supporters. She's been on our research advisory board for some time, and it's people like her who really are helping to give us the credibility that we need to bring the money in to get the work done. She is one of now 25 absolutely stellar world-leading luminaries who sit on our research advisory board and who really, you know, who really, you can't, you can't laugh at sense anymore when you've got those people behind it. 
Yeah, well, I'm I'm really looking forward to um, one day having uh, Nadia perhaps come and speak at a conference in Australia. And it's good that the, we've got all these um, other research institute, uh, I guess, backing up what you're doing, because that means it leads more credibility. So, but what can the lay person do? What can somebody who isn't actually doing research in um, ageing related matters do to help this cause if they so desire? That's a great question. So, of course, one um, thing that you can do if you're wealthy or even if you're not wealthy is actually donate to this. We are, after all, a charity. And uh, actually, we are in the process of trying to make it possible for people in more and more countries to donate to this work in a tax-efficient way. The Cancer Research Foundation itself is a US-registered charity, but we have a UK subsidiary so that people in the UK and actually all across Europe um, are able to donate tax efficiently. We don't have anything equivalent in Australia yet, but we're mm. working on it. And yes, we're also that's working right. in Canada. <laughs> um, so so that's, that's coming. Mm. Um, but of course, it's not all about donations, it's also about advocacy. And there's a whole bunch of things that people can do depending on their circumstances with regard to advocacy. One thing that some people like you can do, of course, is interview me or, or, or my colleagues. Um, or put me on stage at conferences and, and such like. That's something that we, not just I, but now increasingly a number of my colleagues in the foundation put a good deal of time into because we know that it's absolutely essential to get the word out that this work is happening and to eliminate or at least diminish the fantastic level of ignorance and therefore over-pessimism that exists across the world with regard to any of this work. Um, and then on top of that, there's, there's if you like, um, grassroots advocacy, by which I mean simply talking to your friends and your colleagues and your family and generally getting them to understand that this is not science fiction, that is absolutely science foreseeable. But all of these things are possible. But um, you say, you know, what can a non-scientist do? One thing, of course, is to become a scientist. Anyone who's thinking about what to do at the university or whatever, um, you know, maybe they should go into biology. And if they've already decided they're going to go into biology, they should discover which fields are going to be the most effective in opportunities to make a difference in these areas. Central Research Foundation itself is mainly focused on the areas that are being relatively neglected by other people. So, mm -hmm. for example, the kind of stem cell therapy and tissue engineering that um, places like Army are doing is done very well there and, of course, in sim similar institutes around the world. And for that reason, we don't do very much of it. There are a couple of things we do which fit into that kind of space. But generally, we figure that it's not a good way, not, not a good bang for our buck. Uh, a lot of the other things that need to be done that we feel are just as essential as those things, and which would not come under the, if you like, the conventional definition of regenerative medicine, um, those things are very much less well appreciated as, as to either their importance or their feasibility, and that's why we focus on them. Excellent. Well, um, it's been inspiring as always to speak to you again. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the near future with uh, hopefully um, there's a strong bond between you, uh, SENS and Calico from Google. So I'm looking forward to hearing the news there um, and I guess we'll check back at, at another time uh, sooner or later when we know more about uh, that, definitely. So yeah, thanks so much for your time and thanks if there's much. any concluding comments you're welcome to add them at this stage. <laughs> well, I think all I can say is, is what's this space? You know, we mm. have at this point a really sophisticated website which records all the news that's happened about this. You can go there and discover what we were able to showcase at our recent conference in England about three weeks ago with, with a wide range of extremely exciting developments. You can also read about our own research in our research report which is available on our website, sense.org. So that's the place to go. And of course, it's also the place to go if you have any questions. You can um, send us an email through the website and it will be answered by me or by one of my um, extremely able colleagues. Excellent. And so on that note, look in the description for the links. Viewers, this is for you. Look in the description. There will be all sorts of cornucopia of links there. Um, subscribe to my channel, but also um, look at uh, Sens's channel too, which is just... Um, uh, youtube.com slash sends is it or sends would you I think so yes um, yeah. it, it's also linked from, from the regular sense.org website so. yeah that's correct excellent alright well it's been fantastic um, I'll s sign out of the recording now cheers
Thank you.